In 2009, on a beautiful spring day, I was at the Organic Grower School, and I was taking a soil microorganism workshop, and I was listening to this guy talk about EM, effective microorganisms, and my kind of BS detector was like beep, 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 when he was talking, because he was saying all this crazy stuff, and I just thought, I don't know if this is true, I need to confirm this. It was all true. Effective microorganisms, the area of science was pioneered by Professor Higa, Japanese professor, in the 1970s and 1980s, and he identified a group of species, microorganisms, in the soil that worked really well together. And to jump back to the, the soil microorganism workshop, to really simplify the science, in the soil we can think of there being like a good group of species and a bad group of species and then the majority which will go with whichever one of those wins. And we can think of the soil as being in a constant state of warfare. So the good guys are always fighting the bad guys to dominate. And if we want to have healthy plants, which is of course what this was all about, then we want the good guys to dominate. And so it was about how to get the good guys to dominate in your orchard, in your garden, etc. Now, this is true for you as well. You want the good guys to dominate your microbiome. Every, the surface of every living thing on this planet is basically coated with microorganisms. The surface of everything is big enough, to, unless it is a microorganism. And evolutionarily, every bite of food that we ate had microorganisms on it, all kinds of bacteria and fungi. And we indeed are ourselves colonized with microorganisms. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But in the workshop, the guy giving the workshop said that effective microorganisms did the following. They increase crop yield. They protect crops from disease. This is well established. They reduce stinky stuff. They were used after the tsunami in 2004 in Southeast Asia, where all this stuff had washed up on the beach and was rotting. And it was stinky, and it was producing a public health problem. And so they actually sprayed effective microorganisms all over this, which changed the way it was decomposing to be better and reduced the odor. He said they purify waterways. He said that they could cure MRSA, which is the antibiotic-resistant staph infections. And I was like, beep, 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 you know, what? And he said, now this is a big rethink, he said, in Asia, in some places, they're actually used to prepare operating rooms. So think about this. Somebody's going in for surgery, and in the West, what we want to do is sterilize everything. But another way to look at it would be, because these outcompete other organisms, we could spray the operating room with these organisms. Anything bad in there, any pathogens would be killed. They'd be overwhelmed. And so then, while a person is having surgery, if any of these microorganisms get on them or in them, it's no big deal. They're our buddies anyway, and our body will take care of them if they're inside of us, literally. So very different way of looking at things. They also eat fat and grease. They eat other fungi and bacteria, restore fisheries. They're used to restore shellfish beds, reduce manure odor, body odor. People, you know, it works. Treat athlete's foot. I made a friend of mine with athlete's foot for 30 years. I said, you have to do this. Just get out of the shower, rub this on your feet. He did it for 10 weeks, and his athlete's foot was gone. So apparently they treat toenail fungus, yeast infections, irritable bowel syndrome, and Crohn's. People report a reduction of, or abatement of symptoms within 48 hours of taking effective microorganisms. So people take like three tablespoons a day, every day, and uh, that corrects their gut biome. Cures constipation and diarrhea or helps with that. Increases mental clarity. I personally experienced this, and I remember thinking, wow, I feel so much sharper than I have been feeling. Like, is this, is this the EM? I read about this. But then other friends of mine who've taken it have reported the same thing after about 10 days, just this feeling of increased mental clarity, which continues for about three months. And you actually feel smarter. And I don't know if it makes people smarter. It just makes them cocky. I don't know which one it is. But you feel smarter. A lot of people do. I'll take it. Increases energy, changes what people crave, etc. Piglets die easily, like lots of baby animals. And they die from, frequently from intestinal pathogens, like we get, like salmonella. 
So they give baby piglets in some, on some farms, they give them EM and it significantly reduces mortality from these. The same thing happens when humans take effective microorganisms, it protects us from foodborne illness as well. This is just uh, an image of the skin microbiome on humans and shows you that in different parts of the body, on our body, there are different um, species of bacteria in different ratios, just keep that in mind. Our microbiome, you have about 100 trillion cells uh, in your microbiome. There are 10 times more of them than there are of us on, in, in each of us. They control and they can cause us to have significant inflammation response, which is catastrophic. They can also cause people to have depression, anxiety. People with autism have different gut microbiomes than people without autism. There's a link with diabetes, of course. People are initially colonized when they're born, so they go through the birth canal and then they get mom's microbiome and dad's, because dad's not there, but dad's been there, so his microbiome is there. So that's how people initially get colonized, and so we see some different health effects with babies that are born via C-section and don't have that uh, colonization event. So I wanna talk about new applications. We can actually use effective microorganisms to control exotic invasive plants in a few different ways I'll talk about. And we can also protect pollinators and materials uh, in a few different ways, use them as a deterrent. You and I have the great fortune of living in one of the very most biodiverse places in the Northern Hemisphere. But our biodiversity is threatened. The number one threat is loss of habitat, and that's primarily from development. The number two threat to biodiversity here is exotic invasive species. And that will become number one in just a few years, and then climate change will be number one shortly thereafter. But exotic invasive species, and especially plants here, are a major threat to biodiversity, and they are, they're killers. And anybody who doesn't understand them that way just doesn't understand the science. There's a great book, Invasive Species, What Everybody Should Know, What Everyone Should Know, by Dan Zimberloff, who's one of the leaders on this. Easy to read, great scientific information, lots of examples, if you have any interest in that or you can read more technical stuff. But for now, hemlock woolly adelgid, think about that. That's an exotic invasive species. Syphilis, new world, smallpox, exotic invasive species. Syphilis going back to Europe, exotic invasive species. Effective microorganisms can be used to radically improve health, but they can also be used to kill. I did not intend to kill these three lemon drop mangosteens, but then I learned I could. So if you put it on too strong, that's what happens. We know that EM increases seed germination. And one of the problems with controlling exotic invasive plants is that they put seeds out into the seed bank. And so the seed bank just means the seeds that are in the soil. So we can go control them, but if there are seeds in the soil that are gonna sprout in eight or 10 or 15 years, then we have to manage for that whole time. But we can actually force those seeds to germinate by applying EM to the soil. And we know we can do that because we've done it already with weeds, so you end up with a garden bed that has a lot of weeds for about three years, and then radically less weeds, fewer weeds than a garden bed that's not treated. So for example, this is clover, and just notice what this looks like. Some of these are sprouted, notice how long this is, it looks nice and healthy. One in 1,000 dilution, it would look even healthier if it were one in 10,000 dilution. Some of these aren't doing much yet, but they will. So let's put on more and see what happens. This is what happens in my house. This is like literally on my dining room table. What if I put it on stronger? Okay, so this is a one in 50 dilution, and you can see lots more seeds are sprouted, but even the ones that are most far along aren't very big. And if we look even closer, we can see those, actually the tips are brown. What happens next is that those die. So they're kind of like, yay, we're here. Oh, no. So that would be a great thing to do in the seed bank with exotic invasive seeds. So we're doing research on that. It would be great, for example, with privet. Privet seeds can last a long time. It's one of our worst exotic invasives. Japanese stilt grass, different thing. What happens is on the coating of a seed, there are chemicals that retard or inhibit germination. And over time, as those oxidize and other things happen to them, uh, 
they don't inhibit germination and the seed germinates. Effective microorganisms apparently see those compounds and they go, yay, that's food, and they eat them or dissolve them or something. They break them down somehow so the seeds germinate, which is really pretty exciting because we could go in and manage an area intensively for just a couple years and not have to manage nearly as intensively thereafter. We can also deter pollinators. This is one of my very favorite plants for supporting pollination. And anybody who's taken a class with me or spent any time with me knows I'm obsessed with pollinators. Not just honeybees, they're from Europe, actually, and uh, they're fine, I love them. But um, native pollinators, people know about colony collapse disorder, but what's happening with the native pollinator uh, collapse is far worse, and we need to do all we can to really protect those populations and serve them. So anyways, I plant a lot of stuff for pollinators. So I was looking at my autumn joy sedum, and I was thinking, I need to take a picture of this, because there were all kinds of different, there were so many different species just in an area the size of a dinner plate. But first, it's almost dark, and I'm gonna spray some EM on my yard and see what happens. Well, I did not know what would happen exactly, but I will tell you, for the remaining several weeks that that Autumn Joy sedum was in bloom, there was not one single pollinator that visited that plant, ever. I looked at it all the time, like nothing, 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 and I was like, oh man, I can't believe I did that. Everything I sprayed, no pollinators came to. And then one night, I thought, wait a minute. Sometimes we don't want them to come. Here we have a disease called fire blight, which is very bad. And it's spread by bees. So we don't want bees to visit a plant with fire blight. And if we treat that tree to try to cure it, bees that come to it will get sick, basically, and maybe killed by the chemicals that we're using to treat it. So we could actually spray it with EM. And the great thing about EM is if you accidentally get some like on the ground, it only helps. Like if some accidentally runs into the stream nearby, it just makes the stream better. So it's totally different than other kinds of chemical applications. You accidentally inhale some or, well, I wouldn't do a lot of that. But if you accidentally get it in your mouth and swallow it, that's okay. So anyways, so we could spray things. And I will tell you, if anybody has ever had carpenter bees, um, I'll be very excited to find out and I will report back to you whether it actually keeps them from burrowing into my deck. Garlic mustard, one of our bad exotic invasives here. Also, we could use this to not, not just stimulate the seed bank to germinate, but we can actually just go spray effective microorganisms on these plants, the herbaceous plants, when they're blooming and they won't be pollinated which is pretty cool. Some of the woody plants have an extra trick. Some of the woody plants can actually go, oh no, I didn't get very good pollination. I'm gonna sprout up from my root nodes and sprout that way and kind of spread. So we'll have, we're doing some research on trying to figure out what we can do um, with them. Now you might say, okay, how do I get this or how do I integrate this into my life? What would be great is if you could go outside every day and you could pick things and eat them. And you could pick things that would be colonized with good bacteria and eat them. So we have a lot of food on this campus and we have more and more food on this campus and that's great. A lot of people like to grow their own food. This is rainbow chard and some pansies, or violas actually. And both are edible. In your garden, you can grow food and you can spray EM on it and know that that's a healthy way for you to get this kind of thing. You might think though, like a lot of people, I, well, it's February 15th, the year is 2014. We've had an extraordinary winter down here in the south and we just had an earthquake last night too to put a cherry on top of it all. But it's been snowing all week, it's been cold, we've had a bunch of mornings, we woke up and it was two degrees and windy. So how do you grow in that? Okay, so I took this picture on Tuesday. <clears throat> In the top, <laughs> this, is, this was what used to be bok choy, and in the bottom of this picture is what used to be chicory. And they don't look very good, and they're all dried out. I also took this picture on Tuesday, and this is outside, and this is in my yard, and this is chicory, and on the left-hand side is some kale, and this is some bok choy, and some arugula, and there's chickweed in there, and all kinds of other stuff. And I decided to go really old school on this to establish when it is, because it's kind of hard to believe that this happened this week, because between me taking that picture and now, we got about 12 inches of snow. So I went old school on documentation. 
This is this week's Mountain Express, right? So this week's Mountain Express, and this picture I took yesterday with the Mountain Express in it. Before computers and stuff, we used to document things sometimes with newspapers, like this is the date. So you know I could not have taken this before this week, right? So, so on this hugel bed with snow in the foreground, I pulled back. The reason this is all growing is just because it has frost blanket over it. That's all. So it's just frost blanket. I've done a bunch of fancy stuff. I've done hoop houses and all this other stuff, built greenhouse. But actually just shoving sticks into the ground so that they hold the frost blanket up and tossing frost blanket over the sticks and then you put some rocks on the edge to weight it down, that actually works great and it's easier than anything else. And you can have fresh food year round and you can be eating food that you know is well colonized. Because if you think what, how much healthy microflora and microfauna do you think there is in a cornfield? that's been alternated in corn and soybeans for the last 25 years and plowed every season. Just about none, and what's there is probably not very good for you. So getting this stuff into your diet would be an excellent thing to do. And I would encourage you also to investigate biohacking your own microbiome and looking, I, <laughs> I'm, uh, never mind that. Anyways, I would encourage you to investigate biohacking your own microbiome and really doing some research on this because it can radically improve your health and actually save your life and have you have a much greater quality of life, a quality of experience, and enable you to enjoy and participate and contribute to this wonderful world. Thank you for coming.